Over the past few months, I've been building an overland tourer for a client that lives in Germany. It's based on the Toyota Land Cruiser 76 V8 diesel that we are lucky enough to get here in Australia. The build process is now complete. So that in which I share the processes that I use for choosing the accessories, avoiding unnecessary weight, and keeping things practical. I'm Andrew Cynthia White. Join me as I share my passion for building four-wheel drive trucks and then traveling to the remotest parts of the world. I chose Tracklander because they're extremely versatile. They're very quiet, extremely strong, and very importantly, four brackets. For a heavy tent, three is the absolute minimum. I like the fact that they just added more because when a roof rack breaks, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's the feet, something to do with the feet. Having four is extra insurance. This rooftop tent made by Easy On is the traditional fold out type. I don't particularly like them. They're far too difficult and tricky to pack away. In this case though, this was the client's specific choice. The subject of choosing a rooftop tent is far too complex for this particular video. Suffice to say, old-fashioned rooftop tents such as this are considerably more difficult to pitch and pack up than clamshell enclosed rooftop tents such as this. Clamshell type tents are normally more cramped than traditional rooftop tents. Not my first choice. I think you probably have to know your way around them. Or he something knows like his that. way around them yeah. very, very well. Uh, the process of working with a client and a build like this is actually quite interesting because I know a lot about a lot of things, but I'm not the client. And they also know a lot about lots of things. So for example, the tent, they particularly wanted this tent because they're very familiar with this tent. I don't particularly like this tent. And there were a few other things. For example, I actually thought that the troop carrier was a better fit for them and we spoke and spoke and spoke and spoke and I got to the point where while I was trying to convince them that the troopie was the better option realized that if I got it wrong I would the entire build would be a disaster and I eventually had to say okay I'm going to let you choose some parts of the vehicle and of course the most important choice was what vehicle to begin with so I know that they're going to be happy with this vehicle. And now, if this had been a troop carrier, I would be worrying that they're going to arrive in a week's time and not like it because they had their heart set on a 76. The standard springing is choppy. It's the, word that's the only word that kind of comes to mind. So it is very common for people to upgrade the suspension for A, a little bit better load carrying and most importantly, and most significantly, a better ride. For this build, a client had some money to spend, so I suggested the BP51 Allman Emu suspension uh, system, which consists of, obviously, the uh, shock absorbers and a full spring set. I like the ARB. I think they're a good middle price. This is a bit upper from middle, uh, and it's a, good, it's a good setup. But I've driven in 76 Land Cruisers where the ride is so bad, they've been upgraded and as far as I'm concerned it's a downgrade because the the ride is worse yes it can carry a little bit more load but the ride is degraded it is very easy for me to over generalize when it comes to suspension systems but I'm going to give you two pointers um, don't go cheap if you're looking for an upgrade and a because the, the trouble is with a cheap upgrade, it's not an upgrade at all. It might look like an upgrade, but it's not an upgrade. So, the same with all 70 series Land Cruisers, 79 and the 78 Troop Carrier. The ride in the standard form is choppy, but it is the easiest thing of all to improve. Lastly, do the suspension quite late in the process 
if you can, and that's sometimes difficult, but then you'll know what the weight is going to be, what the weight, you know, maximum all up weight of the vehicle is going to be, and you'll be able to match the springs to that. These vehicles to drive in traffic are not nearly as comfortable, not nearly as good road holding, uh, braking, um, you name it, than say an ordinary SUV. Compare this for example to a Fortuna. Uh, the Fortuna is a similar size in wheelbase length and width. Uh, it's far more comfortable, it's far nicer to drive, but and these two vehicles should never, never be confused. Come on, get past me. Because they're designed for two completely different purposes. You cannot call a 76 series Land Cruiser wagon an SUV. It is not a sports utility vehicle. This is an off-road touring truck. There's a difference. And it shows in everything about this vehicle. With any type of station wagon, load space is at a premium. So the very best use must be made of every square inch. To this end, a packing system. There are many packing systems such as this available on the market. Uh, the drawers, uh, they're on rollers. The fridge in this particular case takes up, I mean, I mean, it's very efficient. There's no wasted space. But what is the most significant about this particular unit is the cargo barrier. Because what that cargo barrier means is that I can now pack things on top of here as high as I like, as long as I'm happy not to be able to have clear rear vision through the back door. But it's, it, has, it has increased the packing area here probably by an additional third. When considering how to lay out the back of your vehicle, what you should do is, is think access. Access, what do I need the most often? What do I need every time I get in the car and drive? Every time I stop for a picnic? Every time I stop to camp? And what are the most important items that I will need to get to on a regular basis? And you put that those on the outside of the vehicle. And there are a number of ways of doing that. Now here with this configuration we have all the space in the world because we've removed the back seat. If you don't have that option of removing the back seat but you still need to take every square inch of the back and make it useful, the first thing I recommend is you put in a cargo barrier. With access in mind, with only two seats, of course all of this area to work with. But what we've done is a simple layer with a way to lock that down so items can be strapped on the top or put under the bottom. Heavy items like recovery gear and the compressor, perfect place for them, even water barrels down there and on top soft items, maybe clothes and things like that. It's time now for the electrical installation. In terms of cost this is quite a big one, lots of labour involved, lots of time involved and lots of discussion involved. Principal electrical equipment that needs to be run in the vehicle, this one is a fairly simple one. An inverter for charging batteries, that's 12 volts converted to 220 AC. A fridge, some lighting in the back, a couple of lights outside, a couple of lights in the tent, a couple of power points up front. Simple. I know we have, of course, the main question, where are we putting the battery and where are we gonna put the charger? Now, putting the battery in the engine bay is sometimes an option, but I don't like it because of the heat issue. Okay, yep. and the charger also should be close as possible to the battery, am I correct? Yeah, correct. And I also have to think about how hot the charger might get. So if it's in an enclosed space, if it gets too warm, it generally thinks the whole system is overheating, so it actually pulls current back, and we don't want that. That's correct, yes. What do you suggest with this vehicle? Other items that Heiner will be installing in the Land Cruiser will be a 20 inch light bar, some speakers to replace the terrible Land Cruiser speakers, uh, a head entertainment unit, inverter, Red Arc DC charger, battery monitor, that's the Victron one that I recently put into my own vehicle, I really think it's a good piece of kit, and a few other standing lights 
for when camping around the tent. And of course, the Snowmaster fridge. I would mount the charger somewhere where it's uh, open to the cabin so that when you're driving along you've got your AC on that will automatically cool down your charger as well because it's got the cooling fins on it. Okay. That would work. The battery in an enclosure shouldn't be a problem. It should yeah. not get that hot so I wouldn't be too worried about it. No, it only, batteries only really get hot when they're in an engine compartment that's, and that's, that's when they can yeah. come, become an issue. Yeah. So it's an enclosed safety uh, um, box in the back here. Yeah. Okay. Fuse box. Fuse box I would also put relatively close to the main battery because what you want is you want to have your main circuit breaker for the fuse box. Yes. That should be relatively close to the battery as well. Yes. And then you don't want to go halfway through the car and come back every meter of cable counts right. with DC so you want to keep it as short right. as possible. So keep, sh keep cables as short as possible. Yeah. This is one that's very important. Keep the number of connections as small, short as practical. Yeah, and I've right. seen systems where they had, you know, un I thought unnecessary cutoff switches, but the end result was, yes, you had a cutoff switch, but you actually had quite a bit vol big voltage drop because of them, because they were a little bit too small and the connections weren't great, etc., etc. Yeah. So minimum cable length, minimum number of connections, no unnecessary connections. You agree yeah. with that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and um, if you can get the charging. Uh, and and uh, fuse box as close to the battery as possible, that's good. Yeah, absolutely. And another big one is quality components. Quick word about connections. There are a couple of options when fitting things like fridges and accessories. This is called an accessory plug. It, many fridges are supplied with them and the socket looks something like this. They are to be regarded with extreme prejudice and disdain. They are terrible particularly for high current demanding items like a fridge. Now a fridge doesn't in itself carry, consume that much current. I mean, a good one is running at three and a half amps while it's running. The trouble is that as it turns on, every time it cycles, it needs a good healthy amount of current and it needs it quickly and these cannot deliver it. So if your fridge is underperforming and you've got one of these things, that's the problem. So we will not be using these in any of our applications in this truck. They're fine if you're running a cell phone charger or something like that, then they're okay. And of course, when the vehicle is being driven, these things move around. There's too much movement in there. All right, so here's some alternatives. These are called Anderson plugs. They come in different sizes and they're very good for very high uh, current applications where you're doing a lot of plugging and, you know, for example, a trailer would require a large one of these when you hitch it up to your vehicle and you hitch it up to the vehicle's charging system, you'd need a big one of these. These are pretty good for running fridges and other items like solar panels. They work well with solar panels. They work well with um, uh, compressors and things like this. But there is another one that I wanted to show you and it's called an angle plug and it looks like this. Two pins and you can uh, it actually fits in there like this and the great part about it is that as you push it in clicks in and you can then tighten it so the secret behind that the reason why that works really really well is that there's no movement there's none those are very good for applications like a fridge where it's plugged in and you're not plugging it in and out and in and out all the time. If you're plugging it in and out a lot, then Anderson is better. When it's a fixed fixture in your vehicle or trailer, that's an ideal connector. As soon as you go to cheap components, you go to cheap circuit breakers, all that yes. sort of stuff, you get voltage drop, yes. you get nasties in it. So it always pays in the long run to pay a little bit yeah. more on your accessories. I'm back at Quick Pitch a couple of days later. I just got a call from Hanno saying, I'd like to show you something ready for me to come and have a look. And he has produced uh, this. The principle of a, an electric box in the car. It's very simple. I don't know of a single four-wheel drive enthusiast who has actually built a vehicle and then never changed it, updated it, upgraded it added more stuff and the whole point about this is that if you are going to add
add something to the vehicle later all you do is run a cable to this and everything is in one place what we've also designed in this is the fact that all of these items that run the vehicle electrics are now going to be close together low voltage drop close to the battery low voltage drop minimum amount of connections low voltage drop even the cable to the fridge is in this case i'll show you now very close to the base of this box again reducing voltage drop okay so this is going to be where the box will be sitting later on right on top of the battery right on top of the battery we had to do this cut out here we're going to have the box exactly on top of it so the electrical connections can go straight uh, negative and positive and all of these cables these are just the vehicle connections so you have a seven core cable going to the roof means you only need that one cable all the connections are in there plus a couple of spare cables for things that can be added later on like for example work lights then you've got another four core cable going to the back of the car for power outlets here as well we've got spares in there just in case we want to add on to it and then we also got uh, our extra camping lights in the back here. And that is pretty much it. So as soon as the box goes in, these cables are being run into the box. All the circuits are already there, just have to be connected up and all the rest of the car starts to work. So we've developed this area workspace for the client. Put his laptop here, cameras here, charging batteries here. And this can also be used for a soft bag while traveling. This is tilted slightly towards the user. So looking at the gauges, and it's very easy finding the switches very easy also seeing the monitoring the dc to dc charger is very easy 220 volts ac very easy and of course adding things and servicing and maintenance is really easy and it's got a big hole in the bottom and plenty of space so which means adding things is again really easy covered with a carpet that is extremely unfriendly to velcro which means that Velcro sticks to it like crazy. So if you have a charging device, a light, anything you can think of that you don't, you want to put here, but you don't want it moving around the car when the vehicle is driving, put some hook Velcro on it and stick it anywhere you like. Having the box also so close to access the, into the vehicle. So if you're going to put it in the back of the vehicle, put it close to the back because here we've also put in some extra power points. Power points for general battery charging directly from the battery using um, Anderson plugs and another Anderson plugs for solar power. So in other words, if I now want to add a solar power, connect it to the system, it's plug and play. I don't have to look for a connection anywhere. I also don't have to dive into the car and try and find the connection. It's right there by the door. And the other thing about this, when in the back of the vehicle, things to tend to move around over very, very rough ground. And connections, electrical connections that stick out, get knocked, get bumped. I've had with my own vehicles many, many, many times. And I've learned that it's a very common problem with unprofessional builds in vehicles is that electrical connections are exposed to being bumped by moving bits and pieces inside the vehicle on rough ground. I am doing a trip to New Zealand and I get so engrossed in it and I've suddenly realized I have got to go today to Quick Pitch to make sure that the Land Cruiser build is on schedule and to go and check it out because I've got a couple of videos coming up about that build. The rear packing system has been installed. Time to check the accessibility of the fridge. 57 litre dual door. Exactly the same one as I have in my crew carrier. They've changed this. And actually this is better, this is easier to clean yeah. than the one I've got. Yeah. They've upgraded that. And the way it fits, it is so snug, I don't think you even have to uh, strap it down or anything. It can't go anywhere. Can't go up. It's going to rattle. They're going to strap it down. Yeah. yeah. That's ah, not going to yeah. be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Let's strap it down. Yeah. Nice, nice job. Fits, fits absolutely perfectly. Uh, we could almost hardwire the fridge because you're not going to take that cable out of there anyway. You see what I mean? What I do mean, you mean by hardwire? Does that help? How does hardwiring it help us? 
Uh, hard wiring means we don't have a connector somewhere. We just it will just be. You mean hardwire this? Yeah. Hardwire it. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Because we hardwire. don't really need that you connector there. You don't need the anything. connection there. You've got a connector on that side. If you want to take the fridge out, you unplug it that side. Yeah. Eliminate the connector if you okay, don't cool. need it. I'll just leave that there anyway. <laughs> Yeah. Just in case somebody wants to put a fridge in here for whatever reason, you've yeah. got an extra There's outlet a, there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but then I'm no, going to run the cable through the bottom into yes. the box and actually hook mm. it up to the same circuit. Definitely. All right, Definitely. very good. We'll do that. Okay. What I did now, the USB charge connector yes. comes in from the top, so yes. it's flush mount. Yes. So what you can do is you just lift the mattress up, there's a little cover for it, you can plug your USB cable in, you can charge your telephone. I that is for the outside lights. That one, so you can swap in between the white and the orange. Uh, okay. And that one just does the orange on the inside. Just the orange on the inside. Uh, you've got your, like before, your standards in there. It's all labeled now. Mm -hmm. It is a mistake to assume that your 4x4 specialist center that has done some work on your vehicle has actually done it really well. And it's a very common for somebody to get out on the track and find something goes wrong with their vehicle. And it has something to do with something that is recently fitted. And I found something here that I'm now going to address. These fuel lines, these extra fuel lines put in as part of the extra fuel filter system in this vehicle were not properly tied down they were rubbing on the brake master cylinder there and I have to now do something about it protect the components on which they might rub and of course the rubber pipes are the most vulnerable things and if you get a hole through that rubber pipe the vehicle will stop so don't assume anything. When it comes to a range of a, a touring vehicle, I recommend 1,000 kilometers or 600 miles is minimum for most countries. And, and surprisingly enough, even North America, because I've done some touring in North America, and again, 600 miles is about what you need to have quite a bit of freedom. This standard tank in this vehicle is 130 litres. This Long Ranger, Australian manufacturer, highly respected. It was supplied by ARB as part of their package and this is 166 litres. So 36 litres extra. That's not an enormous amount but it's enough. It's enough to extend the range of this vehicle from quite good to very good. There is an outstanding issue I was hoping the roof rack was going to be a little bit longer, but this is the, the standard roof rack that Tracklander make for the 76, and I would like it to be a bit longer. I don't know why it isn't a bit longer, but I wanted to fit the Max Trax bracket or Max Trax holder in the front, and there's not quite enough room unless our man of the moment, Rob, can make us a bracket. Yes. Can you make me a bracket for this? What shape would you like? <laughs> <laughs> okay. The only problem with a vehicle that I'm seeing now, I mean, I, I love it. I think we've, we've ticked every single box, but that slightly short roof rack. Okay. I don't know why they supplied us with a rack. Anyway, can we fit the Max Trax on the front? Yeah. Can you build a, some kind of cradle that the Max Trax can go in on the front yeah. of that rack? Yes. It's a bracket. So, yeah. We're going to use Quick Pitch's Maxtrax table bracket and adapt it for use here. Because Maxtrax aren't used on a daily basis, easy access is not a priority. But putting them high up on the roof means we get them out of the way. What do you reckon? Doable? Yeah. Hmm? Yes. Firming up a bracket. That's what Rob does. Today we're working on the final bits and pieces of the vehicle, little details like the fire extinguisher and where to 
mount the sand flag. I won't mount antennas or sand flags on the bull bars because I absolutely hate them. So we found a nice alternative on the bracket that holds up the awning. And at this very stage, the client has actually seen the first video and he's replied to me and said he's absolutely thrilled, very, very excited. And I am too, actually, looking at it now, close to being finished. This has been a great experience and it's a great little, a great little truck. In the third and final video, I'll discuss the details as well as the cost of this build. Thank you for watching.